This is Twit. As you commented last week, one of the best named exploits to come along, the the Ryzen Fall, which was, of course, one of the four classes. Uh, the biggest one was the hardware problem in the Chimera vulnerability. These were these were announced uh, as we were literally going to press as to, as I was putting the podcast together Monday when I uh, Monday evening as I was assembling everything, the topic was different. And Tuesday morning, it was, oh, crap, uh, this is important. We need to change the title of the podcast. And so I quickly rearranged things. Um, so in, in the week that has ensued, the controversy, of course, which we discussed last podcast, was that the CTFs, CTS Labs, a, a, a relatively new unknown security firm, the, about a year old, did not provide AMD with the what has now become customary. Well, customary is 90 days. Uh, as we know, Google's Project Zero gave Intel 200 days because of the they understood the nature of the severity and and you know knew that Intel would take this seriously. Anyway. Um, this was not the case with with CTS Labs. There's been a bunch of fur flying over the over the last week. Uh, some people saying that there was no proof of this. Uh, the good news is that uh, one independent researcher, Dan Guido, uh, who we referred to also last week, who's the CEO of Trail of Bits, did independently verify the report and and tweeted to that effect on Twitter. Uh, he said, regardless of the hype around the release, the bugs are real, accurately described in their technical report, which is not public as far as I can tell, and their exploits work. Um, so, so at this point, we're beyond we're beyond wondering whether there's something here, and we're now at the point of like, okay, so what's the impact of this to end users? What's the, you know, how does the world feel about the way CTS Labs acted uh, and where, what, what is AMD's position? So, first of all, the, the consensus is much like Spectre and Meltdown, these are difficult to exploit. They do require admin, and, and, and this is still a little unclear because we don't have details, but the, 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 what, what we're being told is that administrative access is required for these to be exploited, un, which is not true of Spectre and Meltdown, which caused a much more concern. That, that, that is, any unprivileged process was able to, uh, to leverage the, if it was clever enough, the Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities in order to get cross-process information leakage which was the big concern. What we're being told is that this requires administrative access. So you have to first have some privilege elevation in order to get that access and then exploit it. On the other hand, later this podcast, we'll be talking about uh, uh, elevation of privilege attacks, all of which the attackers at last week's Pwn to Own were able to achieve. So we shouldn't take too much. I mean, AMD is trying to play up the fact that, oh, you have to have be an admin. Well, that's not looking like that's that difficult for an unprivileged process to obtain for itself. So, so AMD, as I mentioned before, is on record now acknowledging the four problems. That is basically saying we're not happy with CTS Labs for not giving us any time, but... Yes, we acknowledge ourselves that these are problems. Okay, so in resp but there was a lot of pushback about, you know, like against the way CTS Labs handled this. So I want to share the, the letter that the CTO just published on the amdflaws.com site um, addressing this because, I mean, it's, this is an issue for the industry moving forward, and 
I think he raises some interesting and worth discussing points. He starts by saying, by way of a disclaimer, I am a technical guy, he writes. I love building things and researching things. I do not like the whole world of PR. He says, it is too messy for me. I've written this letter in my own language without PR proofing. Please forgive me if there are any grammatical errors or not written according to correct writing standards. He says, uh, on the history of their publication of these exploits, he said, we have started researching AS media chips about a year ago. And that's about when this group pulled themselves together and declared themselves an entity. After researching for some time, we have found manufacturer back doors inside the chip, which give you full control over the chips. Now, and what's interesting, too, is that a lot of us have these chips on our motherboards. So the focus of their disclosure was AMD because AMD had formally used a descendant of these in their own chipset. But this may still have some farther reaching consequences, which have yet to have been articulated. Anyway, he says full back hardware manufacturer back doors giving you full tr control over the chips. And that's the ASM-1042, ASM-1142, and ASM-1143. So, you know, and if someone's interested, although this hasn't been leveraged as, as far as we know yet into exploits, you can probably determine if those are the, the, the AS media chips on your motherboard. He said... We wanted to go public with the findings, but then saw that AMD have outsourced their chipset to AS Media. So we decided to check the state of AMD. We bought a Ryzen computer and whimsically, he writes, ran our exploit POC, our proof of concept, and it just worked out of the box. Full read, write, execute, on the AMD chipset, as is no modifications. To be honest, he says, we were a bit shocked by it, how they have not removed the back doors when integrating AS Media IP, intellectual property, into their chipset, he writes, is beyond me. So then we said, okay, what on earth is going on in AMD and started researching AMD? He says, it took time to set up the working environment to start communication with the AMD secure processor. But after reaching a full working setup and understanding of the architecture, we started finding vulnerabilities, one and another and another. And not complex, scary, logical bugs, but basic mistakes like screwing up the, di di the digital signatures mechanism. At that point, about once a week, we found a new vulnerability, not in one specific section, but across different sections and regions of the chips. It's just filled with so many vulnerabilities that you just have to point research and you'll find something. He says, Perens, obviously a personal opinion. After that, he writes, we decided we have to go public with this. I honestly think it's hard to believe we're the only group in the world who has these vulnerabilities, considering who are the actors in the world today and us being a small group of six researchers. So he then starts the next section titled Responsible Disclosure. He writes, I know this is an extremely heated topic for debate where everyone has a strong opinion. Unfortunately, I also have a strong opinion on this topic. I think, he writes, that the current responsible, the current structure of responsible disclosure has a very serious problem. If a researcher finds a vulnerability, this model suggests that the researcher and the vendor work together to build mitigations with some time limit, 30, 45, 90 days, whatever at the end of which the researcher will go out with the vulnerabilities. 
The time limit is meant to hasten the vendor to fix the issues. The main problem in my eyes with this model, he writes, is that during these 30, 45, 90 days, it's up to the vendor if it wants to alert the customers that there's a problem. And as far as I've seen, it is extremely rare that the vendor will come out ahead of time notifying the customers. Quote, we have problems that put you at risk. We're working on it, unquote, he writes. Almost always it's post factum. Quote, we had problems. Here's the patch. No need to worry, unquote. The second problem is if the vendor doesn't fix it in time, then what? The researcher goes public with the technical details and exploits, putting customers at risk. How we have accepted this mode of operation, he writes, is beyond me. That researchers advertise at the end of the time limit the technical details of the vulnerabilities because the vendors didn't respond. Why should the customers pay for the vendor's lack of actions? He says, I understand this is the model today and people follow suit, but I think we can do better. I think that a better way would be to notify the public on day zero that there are vulnerabilities and what is the impact to notify the public and the vendor together and not to disclose the actual technical details ever unless it's already fixed to put the full public pressure on the vendor from the get go, but to never put customers at risk. This model has a huge problem. How can you convince the public you are telling the truth without the technical details? And we have been paying that price of disbelief in the past 24 hours. Okay. Oh, boo hoo. But still he says the solution we came up with is a third party validation like the one we did with Dan of trail of bits. In retrospect, we would have done this, <coughs> excuse me, with five third party validators to remove any doubts, a lesson he writes for next time. I know there are many questions and a whole lot of confusion. We're trying our best to answer reporters, update our site with Q and a and clarify what's going on so far. The media focus was on CTS, and I think I understand this, but very soon we will have to deal with the fact that a huge company with products spread throughout millions of computers in the world is riddled with so many problems that it's unclear how to even address this. If you have any technical questions, please contact me at, and he gives his email address, I'll try to answer as many as I can. 